Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Worrying about it is not going to change it. Being upset about it is not going to change it. We have to learn how to deal with things as they are, change what we can change, accept what we can't change, and just learn to be happy. Well, welcome to the program. We're so happy that you've joined us today. We're doing one of our Bible studies today that we've been doing now on and off for a few months, just encouraging you to realize how many wonderful lessons there are in the Word of God and that we should not just read the Bible just for quantity to see how much we can get done, but actually study it for quality. I would rather you read one verse, study one verse and actually get something out of it than to read half of the Bible and get nothing. So yesterday we started on Matthew chapter 6 and I didn't quite get done, so thank God for today. Most of what we studied yesterday was about our motives. And in Matthew chapter 6, it starts out saying that when you, when you give and when you do good deeds, don't do them to be seen of men or to be applauded. You know, don't make a bunch of noise and ruckus about it, but, but make sure that we do what we do unto the Lord and that if we do things to get an earthly reward, then we're going to lose our reward. But if we do things unto God and trust Him for our reward, then what we do in secret, God always sees. And, you know, I think that that's kind of a thought that I would like to start with today because I think about so many people who have assignments from God that are very private. You know, maybe you're called as a helper in the body of Christ, and I don't know, let's just say maybe you clean the church on Sunday after everybody's gone. Well, you know, sometimes people can forget the people who do those kind of jobs, and they don't maybe get the appreciation that, sh that they should, but God sees if your assignment is as an intercessor and you spend many hours a day praying for other people who don't even know you're praying for them, God sees. And I like to remember that we need, we need to always live before what I call the all-seeing eye <laughs> because God sees everything and He knows everything and we cannot hide anything from God. I don't know where you might be in your walk with God today or even if you have a walk with God, but let me tell you that God sees you he knows you. It was Him that formed you in your mother's womb. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan for you. And you need to think about what you're living for. Because if you're just living to get money, fame, you know, you can spend all your life climbing the ladder of success and find out at the end that your ladder was leaned against the wrong building. How many people do we all know that just live for all the wrong reasons and then they ended up with no family, nobody that cares about them, Many times they're, they're just stressed out and worn out and life just becomes meaningless to them. And so it's very important that we do what we do unto the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, whatever you do, whatever might be your task, work at it heartily as unto the Lord, as something done for Him and not for man. And I have to keep this in mind too, you know. Why am I still doing what I'm doing after all these years? Well, I can guarantee you that I'm doing it for the Lord because... I'm old enough and have worked long enough that I could think about retirement. I was with a bunch of people last week and they were all talking about retirement. Well, I've retired, I've retired, I'm going to retire in June, you know, I've retired. Joyce, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't think anybody wants me to do that. <laughs> I'm thinking that's not what I'm going to be doing. And I don't even want to. Dave and I talked about it later and that, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it, you know, but for me that's not what I want because I still want to be fruitful all the days of my life. And so, you know, just everything you do, do it unto the Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your entire body will be full of light. But if your eye is unsound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the very light in you, your conscience is darkened, how dense is that darkness? There's a pretty good chance that a lot of people have read this a long time, myself included many times, and didn't get a thing out of it. So <laughs> I thought this morning, I'm just going to wait on this a little bit and just really see what's in here. So first of all, our, our conscience is like a light in us. And so one of the worst things that we can do is sin against our own conscience. When we do things that we know are wrong, 
it has a terrible effect on us. There's no harder pillow to sleep on or to try to sleep on than a guilty conscience. And there's no more comfortable place to be than to go to bed at night knowing that although you weren't perfect that day and you made mistakes, that your heart was right toward God. And if it wasn't, then you can quickly get it right before you try to go to sleep. And so he's talking about here how we, how we see things and why we do things. If, if your eye is sound, then your body will be full of light. If I shut my eyes, then everything right now is dark. But if I open my eyes and I let the light in, then I have light to do many things. So we, let's just think about living with an evil eye versus a, a good eye. When I look at people, uh, do I look at them suspiciously? Or do I say I'm going to believe the best, like the Bible says? And we all know that a lot of our issues are with people. You know what? We'd all be so godly if there were no people. <laughs> but we, we might just be a little bit lonely and, and not get very much done. I used to say when my kids were little and I was first learning all these things, I could get along with everybody when nobody was home. It was when they came home that I had the problem. And so how we look at people and how we talk about people and how we view people and if we're going to have a merciful attitude toward people, we want to make sure that we're living with a, uh, with a loving eye and not with an evil eye because how I look at you and judge you does get in me and it does affect my joy, my peace, and my walk with God. So let's keep our eyes full of light. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is deceitful riches, money, possessions, or whatever is trusted in. So this is just a, a great place to talk about being wholehearted for a few minutes and to set your heart wholly on what you know that God wants you to do. You know, in Romans chapter 12, it talks about the different gifts that God gives people. It says, if you're a teacher, give yourself to your, to your teaching. If you're a giver, give yourself to giving and do it with simplicity. If you're an encourager, then just get busy and encourage. We don't all need to be like everybody else. We just need to know what God wants us to do. And, you know, in the world, people judge things as well. You know, surely the teacher is more important than the, uh, than the encourager. But that's all worldly stuff. That's not, that's not God's thing. And so whatever you do, you need to do it, and I need to do it with a whole heart, not a divided heart. When our hearts are divided, there's a place, I don't remember the, the reference, but the question was asked us in the Old Testament, how long are you going to halt and limp between two opinions? If God is God, then serve God. And if Baal <laughs> is God, then serve Baal. We know Baal's not God, but these people were trying to have one foot in both worlds. And I think that that's very important for us to maybe think about for a few minutes today because maybe how many of you um, are trying to be a Christian, you got your foot in the Christian world and you want a relationship with God, you want to make sure you go to heaven, you really do have a love for God, but then on the other hand, you really like all these ungodly friends you have and maybe this ungodly job that you have that pays you a lot of money and you really don't want to lose this job, so over here on Monday through Friday, you have to make compromises that make you feel bad inside, but then on Sunday, <laughs> you go to church, and I call up people like that sometimes uh, Sunday morning warriors and Monday morning whiners. You know, we need to make sure that we're the same all the time. I think, to me, one of the greatest compliments that anybody ever gives me or ever says about me is, Joyce is the same wherever you see her. Now, they don't see me all the time behind closed doors at home, you know. How I many of you know if we're going to let out the bad side, it's always in front of people that we know can't get rid of us? <laughs> but I really do make a Holy Ghost effort to be the same all the time. I think the worst thing we can do is stand up and tell somebody else what to do and not do it ourselves. And that, that's why, what the Pharisees and the hypocrites did that was such a problem for Jesus. They were telling everybody else what to do, but they weren't doing it themselves. You know, it, it's easy to teach. The hard part is living. It's even easy to sit there and hear. It's easy for you to flip your TV on every morning and think maybe you've put in your time with God because I've done all the work and you just got to lay there in your bed or sit in your chair or whatever and just take it in. But we always need to listen with an intent to do. 
always. There's no point in even going to church if you're just going to hear a message that you haven't even decided yet whether you're going to do or not. And I think we need to put a little more thought into that. And uh, so you, you can't serve two things. You've got to make your mind up what you want to give your life for. You only have one life to give away. And so I'm just going to pose the question to you today, what do you want to give it for? Let's say you live 100 years. That sounds like a long time, but that's nothing compared to eternity. Forever and ever and ever and ever. And, you know, we go on and say that forever. <laughs> Still be standing here saying it. And so we need to be wise investors and we need to choose right things now, knowing that every good choice produces a good harvest and not be what I call a gambler where we think we can do the wrong thing now and maybe, hopefully, we'll be the one that gets by with it. It just don't work like it. just doesn't work like that. So make your mind up who you're going to serve and serve him with your whole heart. Verse 25, Therefore I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life. What you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or about your body, what you're going to put on. And I'm just going to take a little bit of liberty here and say uh, about what people think of me, uh, about the neighborhood you live in, you know, the car you drive. The thing to do is to do the best that you can and not be worried and concerned about what everybody thinks about it. And then he goes into this discourse about, look at the birds of the air, verse 26, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth more than they are? Can everybody in here say, I'm worth more than a bird? I'm worth more than a bird. And I just dare you to say it at home too, right there by yourself out loud, I am worth more than a bird. <laughs> See? And so, you know, I, I say jokingly, I've never seen a bird sitting on a branch having a nervous breakdown <laughs> because they're not sure where the next worm is going to come from. You know, God feeds them. He takes care of them and not one sparrow falls to the ground without our Father's notice. He's counted every hair on our head and every one we've lost <laughs> as time goes by. It's, you know what is amazing to me about the Bible, really, is it is so practical and so simple. That's why it's not hard for you to learn from it. And please, if you have swallowed the lie from Satan that you just can't understand the Bible, well, I just can't understand the Bible. I read it and I don't get anything out of it. Well, you know, first of all, there's all kinds of translations available today that really help you get more out of it than maybe some of the old Elizabethan English. And, you know, it's the word that's holy, not the cover it's between. So we don't want to think, well, we can only read this or we can only read that. We want to make sure that what we read and study is accurate. But I use an amplified Bible a lot. And if you can't understand the word, we have a study Bible available. There's many other study Bibles available, things that help you. I have all kinds of study tools, all kinds of things that help me understand more. And that's what it means to study. To read means I just go, okay, I got my check mark today. God's happy, and I didn't learn anything. But to take even 30 minutes a day and study will be totally and completely transforming in your life. And, you know, then we think, well, I just don't have time to do that. You don't have time not to do that. You know, I remember years before my husband Dave came to work at the ministry. I mean, I was already teaching and, and going around here doing four or five different Bible studies a week before Dave ever came to ministry with me. But for seven years, he was telling people, someday I'm going to be in full-time ministry. And part of what he did was every day on his lunch hour, he would get out and walk the neighborhood and pray. Now, he had an option. He could sit there with everybody else and murmur and complain and listen to their dirty jokes and, and be uncomfortable. But instead of doing that, he made a good choice then that paid good benefits later on. So we don't, we don't need to be uh, concerned about all these things that worldly people are concerned about. We need to learn the Word of God and live by the Word of God. And that only happens as you really begin to study it more deeply. Verse 27, and who of you, by worrying and being anxious, can add one unit of measure, one cubit to his stature, or to the span of his life? Just another practical example. You can't make yourself one bit taller. <laughs> if you're too tall and you don't like it, you can't make yourself one bit shorter. I'd love to have hair that's got a lot more body. 
but my hair is like baby hair, very fine, and I have to keep it real short if I want it to look like anything. And now, as I have gotten a little more gray hair, which none of you will ever see, by the way, <laughs> I now have this big colic in the back of my head, and so when I get up every morning, it looks like the parting of the Red Sea back there. <laughs> and actually, Dave has to fix my hair in the back every morning now. Well, I don't like that either, but you know what? Worrying about it is not gonna change it. Being upset about it is not gonna change it. We have to learn how to deal with things as they are, change what we can change, accept what we can't change, and just learn to be happy. Not worry, not be frustrated, not be frantic. How much time is wasted from worry? And how many sicknesses and diseases there are just strictly from nothing but the stress that worry places on us? Verse 28, and why should you be anxious about clothes? Consider the lilies of the field and learn thoroughly how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his magnificence, excellence, dignity, and grace was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and green and tomorrow is tossed into the furnace, will he not much more surely clothe you, O you of little faith? Say, I'm worth more than grass. <laughs> So, so practical. I mean, can you just get this message today? Maybe you've been worrying about stuff that you can't change. Well, God's inviting you today through this study to say, look, you're worth more than a bird, surely. You're worth more than the grass, surely. And look at how I decorate the lilies. There's no person on the earth who's got an outfit that's as gorgeous as that. Look at how I take care of the birds. They're not sitting on a branch having a nervous breakdown, and I always take care of them. And so you say, well, I can't help it. I'm just a worrier. Well, the first thing you need to change is stop saying that. And you need to say, I don't have to worry. I don't need to worry because God loves me, and he's taking care of me, and I can't do anything about the situation anyway. You know, I use the analogy a lot that worries like sitting in a rocking chair rocking all day. It keeps you busy, but it gets you nowhere. <laughs> you know, we, we never make any progress from doing that but it does just keep us busy. And it, it really, when you worry, you lose your focus from the things that you should be focusing on. Amen? So God takes care of all the little things. Therefore, verse 31, do not worry and be anxious saying, boy, here we go. Do not worry saying. Our thoughts become our words, don't they? Yeah. And then our thoughts and our words become our moods. And then our thoughts and our words and our moods become our attitudes. And then we leave the house to go out in the world and we go with a bad attitude, in a bad mood, <laughs> with a scowl on our face, all because we're doing something that's not doing any good at all. And you know, I had to face facts years ago as a teacher that it's pretty useless to tell people not to worry. You say, well then why are you doing it today? Because I have to keep telling you. And <laughs> You say, well, wait a minute, I'm discouraged if you say it's useless. Well, it's, it's not that you won't eventually get it, but I'll tell you what it takes to stop worrying. How many of you want to know what it really takes to stop worrying? Are you ready for this? Okay. You have to finally try everything that you can try <laughs> and finally realize that you're just not smart enough to run your own life or to solve your own problems. I can't figure this out. I don't know what to do. And I sure wish God would tell me, but he hasn't told me yet. And so therefore, I might as well enjoy this day he's given me because it is a gift from God. Do you know that it's okay for you to enjoy life while you have a problem? Come on, that's a revelation to people. It is okay for you to enjoy your life while you have a problem. I think sometimes we think, well, you know, I can't, I can't enjoy my life. I got this problem. I can't enjoy my life. My kids are doing this or my spouse is not doing that or, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the truth is, is you only play into the devil's hands when we let him make us miserable because he's really not after your stuff. He's after your joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so if he can get us to worry about 9 million different things, and I'll tell you something, the minute that you begin to worry, the best thing to do is pray. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace that passes understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.
That's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You know, I had a situation yesterday came up, something happened, and it's something that has happened repeatedly, and, you know, you really get tired of that stuff that just, it's always the same, always the same, always the same. <laughs> and you're like, okay, God, I've prayed about this for 25, 30 years. Are we ever going to see a breakthrough here? And it's not even something concerning me. It was something that somebody else did. And so I started with the, the worry. And then I started to get upset. And then I thought I'd follow my own advice. <laughs> Do you know what would happen in our lives? Come again, now most of you working in this ministry, you know enough of the word that if somebody asked you for a word of advice, you could give it, right? How many of you think that if somebody came to you and said, what do you think I should do? That you might be able to just give them a little bit of advice. Let's see your hand. Okay. And so all you really have to do when you're in trouble is take your own advice. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I thought about that. Now, what would, what would I tell somebody else if they came to me with this situation? God's got a plan. If it's taken this long, it's for a purpose. All things work out for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I would have quoted him a couple of scriptures just like I just quoted you, and I would have thought how wonderful my advice was. <laughs> but why can we not take our own advice? So how about when you're, when you're in trouble now and you're all upset, how about if every time you're upset, come on, I'm talking to you at home, how about the next time you're upset, when you feel that upset, you just stop for a minute and say, now if somebody else came to me with this same problem, what would I tell them? <laughs> and then take your own advice. So I knew what I'd tell somebody else. Well, pray about it, see what God says. So I prayed about it. Well, God, what are we going to do in this situation? And you know exactly what the Lord said to me? Forget it. Just forget it. You can't change it. It comes and it goes. It may come again. It'll go again. <laughs> Nothing lasts forever. Just forget it. Go on and enjoy your day. And so I called somebody else that had been kind of the receiver of the same situation, and I said, God just says forget it. See, you're all looking at me like, really? <laughs> you know why we want something more complicated? I mean, that's what the Bible says to do when somebody hurts you, offends you. Forget it. <laughs> Let go of it. Lose it. Lay it down. Give up the resentment. You can keep it if you want to, but let me ask a question. Surely we can get smart enough to stop doing things that are totally useless. It's useless to worry. It's useless to try to do something about something you absolutely cannot do anything about. Can I do anything about this? Lord, if you got a good idea, give it to me because I don't have a good idea. If you can't think of anything, just say, well, God, I guess you know and you're not ready to tell me yet. Go ahead and make the devil mad and say, I'm going to go ahead and enjoy my day. Because nothing makes him madder than our joy. Because he's lost all of his and he wants to take all of ours. doesn't do us any good to worry. It doesn't do us any good to stay mad at people. So don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to do? What are we going to wear? Blah, blah, blah. For the Gentiles and the heathens, now he's talking about unbelievers, do that. They wish for and crave and diligently seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So here now we're coming to the very end of this chapter, a well, well, well-known verse, Matthew 6, 33, but seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of being and doing, and all of these other things will be given you beside. We don't have to worry about things. We serve God, and he takes care of the things. Do not worry or be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own. Oh, I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> Sufficient for each day is its own trouble, and also the grace that we need for each day comes when the day comes. We don't get to put grace in the bank. <laughs> Did you hear me? You can't go put grace in the bank. I'd like to have enough grace right now for the whole rest of my life. It's like the manna that came down from heaven. 
if they tried to gather tomorrow's today, it got rotten. Well, I hope you've enjoyed being with us today. We've certainly enjoyed you being with us. And I want to encourage you to watch the program as often as you can because the more you hear and receive the Word of God, the better your life is going to be. Así escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba cómo a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener la familia como en secreto, esas cosas. Que no, que era fea, que, no, que nadie me pescaba, que no había esperanza en mí que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme. Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step-by-step -step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they are reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Jimena, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, eh, de, de, del abrazo eh, familiar, del abrazo de alguien que, que te ama, eh, lo, que, lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumentos de Dios. Y esta es mi familia, ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. What do you see now? Cuando estoy trabajando, mucha gente se acerca a mí y me dice, oh, su sonrisa, usted tiene algo especial. A ver qué es especial. Y una vez me detuve y miré el espejo, pero miré mis ojos. Y me dijo, yo hice esto. Y era mi rostro. What an amazing privilege to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman, it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty. And you can do that with us right here in Chile, as we've been talking about, and in many, many places all over the world.
werk, huishouden, vrije tijd en nog veel meer. Het moederschap is een fulltime uitdaging. Groeit alles je soms boven het hoofd? Krijg weer rust, zelfvertrouwen en vreugde die dieper gaat. Laat je inspireren door Joyce Meyer, zelf moeder van vier kinderen. Je hebt het verdiend. Het boek van Joyce Meyer, de zelfverzekerde moeder. Bestel je eigen exemplaar nu via joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch via 026 2022 100. Een vervuld leven komt niet uit de hemel vallen. Maar het is zeker mogelijk, zegt Joyce Meyer. En ze laat je graag zien hoe je dat kunt bereiken. Maak kennis met Joyce. Met haar levensverhaal, met haar tips voor het dagelijks leven, met haar boeken en alle andere impulsen die je kunnen leiden naar een vervuld leven. Bestel gratis de informatiebrochure en bel 026 20 22 100. Of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure.